Hey, Explicitly Pro-Life listeners, this is Students for Life's spokesperson, Autumn Higashi, jumping on to let you know about a new special series called Let's Talk About Abortion that will be airing here on Explicitly Pro-Life podcast for the next three weeks. This series is co-hosted by myself and Students for Life spokesperson, Christine Jurgen, and on these episodes, we will take a deep dive with our guests about their personal abortion-related stories and some of the most pressing topics on the pro-life movement right now. So tune in for the next three weeks here on Explicitly Pro-Life. You don't want to miss this. In this special edition of Let's Talk About Abortion, Three expert women share their findings with the abortion pill. The picture of myself in a wedding dress throwing Clinton Gore signs into the Potomac, uh, <laughs> and we were protesting at the FDA about those pills in that time frame. That Walgreens, Rite Aid, and CVS are now going to be distributing the abortion pill. Studies show us that there are four times the complications after chemical abortions. Join us for an eye-opening look at the dangers caused by the abortion pill. I'm Christine Jurgen, and this is Autumn Higashi. And today we are talking about the future of the abortion industry. We know where it is headed and we must gain control of the narrative now before it's too late. We have seen the misinformation spread. We've seen the rise yeah. of chemical abortion, the abortion pill, and we need to have honest conversations because there are serious dangers and risks. And so today I'm really excited to sit down with people who have quite the knowledge behind this topic, personal experiences, you know, medical information. And so I think it's a good conversation to have because it is desperately needed as we see the rise in our culture. Let's talk about abortion. Let's talk about Ladies, abortion. Do you want to come join us? Okay, Tony, why don't we start with you? You Welcome. have a... <laughs> we're just going to throw we're just gonna jump right in, actually. Why don't you, uh, for, for the table, uh, in case any of us don't know each other here, just Introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. We're going to have all of you ladies introduce yourselves, but we'll start with you. Okay. Well, my name is Tony McFadden. I am a pro-life activist, and I also am an author, and God has called me to expose the lies of abortion. I have a personal story that goes along with it, so, yeah. Thank you. I am Christy Stonehammock. I'm the uh, Vice President for Policy and Media at Students for Life of America, Students for Life Action. But in reality, my interest in chemical abortion has been decades. I remember when they brought it on the market. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a picture of myself in a wedding dress throwing Clinton Gore signs into the Potomac. Uh, <laughs> and we were protesting at the FDA about those pills in that time frame. So I've hated them for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. And introduce yourself for us. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Ingrid Skopp. I'm a board certified OBGYN. I've been practicing in Texas for 30 years. Um, I'm so passionate about this issue that I recently uh, went to work full time at the Charlotte Logier Institute as their director of medical affairs. Just want to educate everyone on this. Yeah, so you have a lot that you can share with us and kind of debunk some of the people who say, uh, you know, you don't have a medical degree, so you can't talk about this. <laughs> yeah. I'll just start pointing. I'm like, I have a friend, actually. <laughs> you very well. She said. <laughs> So, Tony, we'll come back to you. Tell us a little bit about your story. You had an abortion. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that experience was like. Yeah, I was a senior in high school and was dating a guy off and on for like two years. And, um, you know, when you have sex, you can create a baby. That's how <laughs> that works. And he right away said, you know, a roundabout way, you don't want to keep it, do you? And at the time I had told my best friend and she just reinforced like, you can't keep this baby. And of course you're scared. I don't want to yeah. tell my parents about it. Listening to probably two of the closest people in your life at the time. Exactly. Yeah. But I love to tell people as well, those were the only two vo voices that I heard. Mm -hmm. So what we do now is so vitally important because I wish I would have had someone intervene to tell me the truth. But that is not my story. <laughs> so um, I was about seven weeks along. I didn't know anything about fetal development. I was so uneducated and the abortion industry loves that. They love when you're not educated. So my boyfriend and my best friend came with me. And I think my boyfriend only came just to make sure I you know, went through <laughs> with abortion. But um, they gave me the chemical abortion pill. They called it RU486. Yeah. And I remember getting an ultrasound and the screen was faced against the wall. And I asked mm. the nurse if I could see the screen and she 
visibly was agitated with me just for simply asking that question. Mm -hmm. And she tried to steer me away from it, but I just said, I just want to see. So she started to turn it around, and before I could say say anything, she said, see, it's nothing. It's just the size of a pea. And in my Mm -hmm. uneducated mind, I'm still thinking like, okay, it's not a baby, even though I knew it was a baby, but I'm looking for an adult to give me guidance and you have this adult who is a professional telling me who has authority telling me this is okay this is normal it's just the size of a pea it's a so I took the first set of pills in the doctor's office he didn't explain to me exactly like what the pills would do he just said this will stop the pregnancy just take and he just gave me a cup with juice in it and put the pills in it and he said, just drink this and... Yeah, just trust me, the medical yeah. professional. Right? Yeah, again, yeah. and they have this aura about them, like, mm-hmm. I don't even want to ask any questions because right. I'm scared. It's closed off. You know, yeah. so um, they gave me more sets of pills to take 24 to 48 hours later. And, okay, my boyfriend breaks up with me the next day, mind you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> After you took me. So just think, a teenage girl... You're not telling your parents about this. Two people know the most traumatic thing just happened to you. Your boyfriend breaks up with you. Now you got to take these pills that are supposed to expel this pregnancy. And I took them, but nothing really happened. So I call them and they... Even after the second pill, nothing happened. This, yeah, the second pill, nothing happened. They gave me two sets of the second pill. Okay. So I took that one. Nothing happened. I call them, and I will never forget the tone of the woman's voice. Wait, can voice. we back up? Yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding if anybody watching really confused. If yeah. we, if they gave you two pills, or two sets of the second pill. Did they do that because the first, second pill didn't do anything, so they had to give you another one, or they just gave you two when you left? They gave me two when I, two sets of, so there was four <clears throat> altogether that they gave. They gave me two at the actual mm-hmm. clinic, and then they gave me two sets afterwards, okay. which was four altogether. So I was supposed to take two. Those two didn't work gotcha. on my own. Gotcha. And then when I called them, they said, this is why we gave you two sets of pills. Mm. So I think maybe they were this expecting was expecting it, expecting to, not it not to work. Yeah, that's but what I, I don't wanted know. to clarify yeah. there. But I don't know. I'm just doing what they're... Yeah. <laughs> told yeah. me to do yeah. so they I just re- remember how condescending mm-hmm. they were on the other line well this is why we gave you two sets of pills just yeah. take the other ones and you'll be fine and you don't often hear the same thing with any other medical procedure right I've never gone to a doctor to ask about you know a, a minor issue and, and then treat me with such annoyance mm-hmm. you know and so I think I can't help but think that that's a conscience coming or through. That here's or here's a medication, it might not work. So we're yeah, just going to be so sick of having to her. continue to do this. But it's just so interesting because in any other, pers- you know, in any other mm-hmm. realm, I mean, that would be you, so mm-hmm. odd. You got yeah. to be in a doctor's office and saying, "I'd like two sets of antibiotics in case the first one doesn't kill." Right? Them. Yeah, exactly. You don't be like, "I'm not giving you a second set." Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. they already got their money. Yeah. yeah. So like we don't want you back. They don't. So we'd need rather you. set you with more than you need than to have to deal with you again. Right. Exactly. That's what that's right. Is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I did take the other set and I bled a little bit and I thought, OK, well, she said it was just the size of a pea. So maybe that's it. Close to two months later, I'm in school. I'm sitting in music class and I start getting the most excruciating pains throughout my entire body. It felt like lightning like Mm. (laughs) across my entire body I can't even move and Mm. I'm like what is happening because it came on like suddenly Mm -hmm. Um, a friend walks me to the nurse's office and I'm not being graphic just to be graphic but I think people need to understand that first trimester abortion is traumatic and it's not just popping pills and you know you're done back to Um, normal life Right. And I felt this pressure and I went into the bathroom and I had blood clots the size of my fist leaving my body. And I didn't realize it then, but I was hemorrhaging. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about the 24 women that we know of who passed away taking these very same pills. They just updated that to 28. Can you believe it? Just about a week or two ago. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's probably more. Oh, I'm sure (laughs) there are. Yeah. You know, um... And, and you're in school while this is happening. In high school. I, that's shocking. Yeah. Yeah, in the nurse's office. And my mom came and picked me up. And my parents don't know. 
-hmm. They have no clue about what's going on. And I just remember going from... At this point, from, did your school nurse know? Was she aware of it? So she's just... I just said I had back cramps. I'm oh like, gosh. I just... And that was normal so for girls. Like, oh, They're like, yeah. here's a heating pad. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You're like, I don't know if that'll help, but thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, but man. I was still scared to tell yeah. anyone. To tell anyone, I'm sure. Did you put two and two together? Did you think that... Did you just think this was just a weird <laughs> thing happening? Or did you think I it had to do with the pills? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was like, oh, you knew? this was mm -hmm. what was supposed to happen two months ago. Yeah. And I just remember laying in fetal position in my bed and going back and forth to the bathroom for hours. Oh, gosh. And just that realization of the, you have this realization that this isn't normal mm -hmm. and this is going to affect me for the rest of my life. But you stuff it down and you pretend like, it didn't happen because society is saying this is normal. Mm -hmm. This is just what you have to do and it's okay. But inside, it, I think for a woman, it changes you because we're supposed to give life, not take it. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I do what I do because if I could spare mm -hmm. any woman from having to go through this, it's worth it for me to share the pain because I'm sharing it with purpose and not. I think what's really funny to me about that story is I bled in three or four pregnancies which was terrifying. And then you're calling the doctor and they're helping you. And you're by yourself, mm -hmm. you know. It never occurred to me when I was bleeding I had to do it by myself. And that really, I find profoundly troubling. Because mm -hmm. I've experienced it in a different way but in the middle of a lot of medical intervention. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just terrible. Yeah. Do you think, and you kind of answered this I think a little bit, but do you think the abortion industry prepared you for what you were going to experience, you said they, you know, they gave you the pills. It's nothing but a pee. D yeah. yeah. Do you feel like they prepared you? Knowing what I know now, absolutely not. <laughs> because I was already uneducated, right. so th it wasn't like they said when you take this these pills, it's going to block the hormone progesterone, and you're, the baby is going to starve to death. They're, I mean, explain it to me like that, and see if I yeah. wanted to yeah. take the yeah. pills, you know. Um, and because of my hesitation, even wanting to see the screen, she didn't pick that up and say, "Are you sure? Maybe you don't want to do this, like, or make sure I was educated." Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't want to do that, and so. This is why pregnancy resource centers are so important because they're not going to hide the fact of the reality of abortion, but they're going to tell you the other side and give you like the resources. Um, even if a woman ends up walking out and still choosing abortion, at least at least yeah. she yeah. received everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, recently at our local pregnancy resource center, they opened the doors at 7:30 a.m. to do an ultrasound for a girl who had an abortion mm -hmm. appointment at 9 a.m. at Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. So they showed up and. And she still went through with the abortion. But, you know, it, it's worth showing up and being there for them. And it's so crazy that, I mean, one of the most common talking points I hear is about choice. Well, how can you really make a choice if you don't know what the yeah. choices are? Mm -hmm. If I'm not being told about what I'm deciding, then right. how is that even a choice yeah. right. at all? It's called exactly. informed consent. Exactly. <laughs> and I can't help but think of, you know, we are at protests and rallies, and there are women who are on the pro-abortion side who are post-abortive. And you said something that kind of, you know, struck this thought of you stuff it down. Mm -hmm. And there's almost a sense of, this has to be okay. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I have to let that out. Yes. Otherwise, I have to deal with these feelings. Mm -hmm. And if I can just get rid of it and listen to the abortion industry of, of just keep living my life, mm -hmm. I don't have to address this pain. And I tell people that's what set me free was when I admitted mm -hmm. I took the life of my own child. Mm -hmm. That is the most horrific, horrible thing to come to grips yeah. with. But that reality of not blaming it mm -hmm. and just receiving that like I did do that and um, I can't take it back but yeah. I can help others not go through it right. or I can help women who've gone through this to know that there's hope mm -hmm. and that there is there can be healing yeah. on the other side yeah. so um, it's hard but you know it's worth it for me to share yeah well thank you for sharing Dr. Scott I know you probably know that her stories you're probably not in the minority oh, of women I and so I, common. I, I would love so to hear just women. your experience of you know the damaging 
reality and effects of abortion and what you see in your own practice. Yeah, I mean, for 30 years, this is why I'm so passionate about it, because I've just had these conversations over and over and over again. And I think what was said earlier is that this is unlike any medical procedure. It is treated differently. The informed consent is different because they don't truly inform mm -hmm. the young girls. There is a rush mm -hmm. to, to, to get you through it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we see that when we look at Planned Parenthood's annual report. 96% of their pregnancy services mm -hmm. are abortion. Right. Very, it is very hard to get out of Planned Parenthood with your baby. Yeah. I've, I've had patients tell me that. Wow. So, you know, chemical abortion is just another step, a horrible step in the wrong direction. Um, and I think there's a lot of motivation for chemical abortion. Obviously, it's easier yeah. for the providers. Mm -hmm. They're pushing the abortion procedure off on the women. Yeah. You're having to mm -hmm. deal with it rather than they're having to hire a surgeon who has to deal with it. I mean, right. somebody sees that baby, right? So it's easier for the abortionist to say, you want this, it's more natural. Mm -hmm. What they don't tell women, well, backing up for a minute, just so the audience understands, mifepristone, you said RU46 or mifeprex is the first component, it blocks the hormones. Mm -hmm. So it kills the embryo or fetus, um, but it doesn't get the tissue out. So 24 to 48 hours later, they give mesoprostol or Cytotec. And I think the reason that they gave you the two, mm -hmm. like you say, it doesn't always work. It does. It induces labor um, to push the tissue out, but many times the <clears throat> tissue's left. Mm -hmm. So they're, don't bother me, take another round. Um, they, the abortion industry publishes studies. They say, oh, it's 98, 99% effective. What they don't tell you is we don't have a good way to track complications. Or anyway, <laughs> when you, yeah. when not you've not way. been, There's no way, right? When you've not been told, yeah. Are you going back to that abortionist when you when that happened? No, you're going to come to me. Maybe your gynecologist. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to go to an emergency room because you're going to be so frightened. Mm -hmm. right. And um, a study showed that even in the emergency room, known abortion complications, sixty percent were miscoded as miscarriages. So there's just uh, no way. Or deliberately miscoded. That's well, what I always you know, I, it, it's you know? hard to know. But I think sometimes the doctors don't want to know. Right. They don't ask. Uh, the women are actively being told, don't tell them. It's true. So there's wow. so many different reasons that that happens. But Wait, the women are being told, don't tell the doctors. Yes. I also can't help but think uh, of teen girls that doesn't seem who safe. are having complications <laughs> and don't want to say. You want to know, right. oh, I just had an abortion. Start right? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know I what's going even, on. Right. They want to, and also because of the way um, abortions are paid for privately, yeah. you go back to the abortionist, they charge you for a procedure. You go to the um, emergency room, pretend like it's a miscarriage your insurance covers it. So there's all sorts of no, pressure so coach them not that. to know. And in fact, yeah. um, wow. with what the FDA has done, progressively removing um, any kind of supervision, most recently they took, there's a black box warning on mifepristone. It can cause a, a very serious, some of these women that have died from a very serious um, infection without a white blood cell count, without a fever, yeah. with even without significant pelvic pain, and yet women can have a very serious infection. Mm -hmm. That block, black box warning always said, if you go to the emergency room, you tell them FDA has removed that. Yeah. So more and more, they're trying to hide these complications. Mm -hmm. But when we look internationally, when we look at good studies, probably one out of 20 women have what happened to you. They don't pass one the tissue, one out of 20. And I, and I see it, number. and I'm, I'm practicing in Texas. Thank God it's illegal there now, but I took care of a woman last week who went to California. They gave her the pills so that she could bleed all the way back to Texas. Oh and she continued to bleed for two months before she came into an emergency room and we discovered she had all this dead tissue in her uterus. They sent her from California they, to Texas. Just, just, right, just, yeah. yeah. And, and I even called the abortionist and said, why did you give a chemical abortion to a woman that you know will not be able to come in? And he said, "Well, we don't we don't like to do a surgical and have them get on a plane or travel because they might bleed." I, I thought, "You don't know? But have you not seen what happens with these chemical?" But wow. but it's just I mean it's um, it's an upside down world mm -hmm. the way that these women are pressured and the women <coughs> think it's more natural and safer. But studies show us that there are four times the complications mm -hmm. after chemical abortions. Makes sense. And mm -hmm. surgical gets everything out right away. Chemical, you have to, your body has yeah. to do mm -hmm. it. And maybe it can't do it. And 
you know, the, the restrictions are being progressively removed for political reasons. Now women can get it without ever seeing a doctor. Which is incredibly dangerous considering course, women yeah. who have ectopic pregnancies. Right. I mean, that's something I, or maybe I talk. farther along. You know, yeah, like I know. I, I speak things, to women, yeah. um, you know, on the sidewalk of Planned Parenthood. And, yeah. and it's a place where I always try to find common ground because I just think, there's no way that you honestly believe mm -hmm. that if a woman has an ectopic pregnancy, she shouldn't at least get an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But the abortion industry is okay with it because they know mm -hmm. the pull and the power of seeing your baby moving. And that's why they mm -hmm. didn't want to show you. Mm -hmm. And so it is a way for them to increase the amount of abortions, decrease the cost of right. it. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't have an abortion reporting law, so they're not accountable right. to the women who are being harmed and infected. But um, yeah, I mean, that's an area that I always am shocked yeah. that yeah. we're not talking more about is the ectopic pregnancies yeah. Yeah. and the it's, lack it's of It's heartbreaking. It's 2% of pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon. Right. And one study actually showed that a woman was 30% more likely to die from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy if she was undergoing a medical abortion. Wow. Because what happens? You're hurting. Yep. You're bleeding and you think that's normal you and it's your body much. trying to tell you something is really oh. wrong mm -hmm. and those your tube ruptures even if you don't die perhaps you have infertility you've destroyed a tube right. all of these things are just so, so much of a demonstration that the abortion industry does not care about women right. that they're right. promoting this dangerous yeah. procedure and you experienced it but just how many women experience seeing their baby's body right. in the toilet. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the emotional ramifications of that? No one's discussing it. And I think the women are ashamed. And perhaps they think, I deserve this because of what I did. But they're living, I mean, at eight weeks, it's about the size and it looks a little bit like a gummy bear. It's got a head, it's got arms, mm -hmm. legs. Mm -hmm. They can see, that that's they know that yeah. that's their child and well, that it was their action. One of the things they we uh, hear at Students for Life quite a bit is women will say they'll have one chemical abortion, but they'll never have two. Mm -hmm. It's that mm -hmm. bloody, it's that horrifying, and mm -hmm. babies are born mm -hmm. alive even, mm -hmm. and you're responsible, and people are picking them up and putting them in the freezer or having a little, mm -hmm. uh, a little ceremony, a ceremony mm -hmm. and a burial mm -hmm. in their backyard, mm -hmm. and the disposal of these bodies, which are truly bodies, mm -hmm. then it's the mother bearing her child. Yeah. And it's another horrifying level of trauma for mm -hmm. people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the women that I have spoken to, I've never heard anyone saying, yep, it was exactly how the doctors described it to me. I mm -hmm. felt comfortable, I felt informed. I mean, the women that I've spoken to have said they were laying on their bathroom floor and were thinking to themselves, this is go is how I'm going to die. Not mm -hmm. I think I might die. No, no, this is it. Like right. I don't see myself getting out of this. Mm -hmm. You know, words like slaughterhouse is how they described yeah. what their bathroom. I mean, it's just that is yeah. the norm, and yet the abortion mm -hmm. industry to pretends like it's not. Yeah. The New Yorker had an article that was it was called My Favorite Abortion. And I know that's a very horrifying thing. And it was mm -hmm. a woman who'd had three abortions. And she had a surgical mm -hmm. abortion and she mm -hmm. said she didn't mind. I mean, I think I she think was there was a lot of pain underneath it. Mm -hmm. Then she had a chemical abortion and wrote at length about how horrifying it was and how un dishonest the abortion industry is about these things. And she got pregnant the third time and she had a surgical abortion the third time. Mm -hmm. And her favorite abortion, she said, was the third one. Because now she knew the difference. And, and although that's a really cold and callous story, we really do hear that, that this idea that this pill is, it's just like a period and you're mm -hmm. gonna basically take a magical Tylenol, yeah. mm -hmm. couldn't be further from women's experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you something while we have a doctor here? Sure. Um, people are, tell us that the abortion pill reversal isn't a thing, that it's not that. safe. In Colorado right now, they're trying to introduce something where they will, it will be a punishable offense if you do the abortion pill reversal mm -hmm. or if you advertise for the abortion pill reversal. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about A, what that is, if sure. it's safe, does it actually save babies and work? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for, for starters, the reason there's so much resistance is the abortion industry doesn't want us to know that women regret their abortions. I mean, right. what causes a woman to seek that? They also don't want us to know that coercion occurs. Mm -hmm. And of course, now that they're unregulated, that's going to be happening more and more and more because it's no longer a doctor looking a woman in the eye mm -hmm. and determining that she wants the abortion. If it's telemedicine, if it's through the mail, it's not even the woman mm -hmm. necessarily right. ordering right. the abortion. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very common for a woman to walk out of the clinic, um, 
have, having taken the pill or, or taking it at home and to say, what have I done? And um, mifepristone, as I told you, blocks progesterone receptors. Right. So we know this is the same um, uh, theory that's behind Narcan for opioid overdoses. You send in something to compete for those receptors, <coughs> you can knock it off, and you can potentially keep the pregnancy going. So it's an anti-progesterone, so pro abortion pill reversal is merely giving high-dose progesterone. Mm -hmm. Progesterone, the name tells us, this is a pro-gestation hormone. Mm -hmm. Every pregnancy needs it. They give a natural progesterone, which is just like what the body sees. Mm -hmm. That's the most natural thing you can do. There's nothing harmful about the progesterone. The abortion industry has gone to great length to say it's dangerous, but of course, what is dangerous is the mifepristone. You know, so yes, sometimes women die, I mean, not die, but bleed a lot, perhaps even after the progesterone, but the progesterone was trying to reverse the process. It was the mifepristone right. so if there's that effects, caused the bleed. Yeah, exactly. Pill, not and reversal. Every OB-GYN, we give progesterone like candy in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. You've had a, a prior loss, mm -hmm. we'll give you progesterone. You had an in vitro fertilization, we'll give you progesterone. You're having some bleeding, what can we do? Well, let's give some progesterone. It can't hurt. Right. We know that it supports the pregnancy. So um, there's good studies um, that... Um, show us that three or 4,000 women have been able to continue their pregnancies. It doesn't save every pregnancy. Um, probably it increases the odds from about 25% if she just took the mifepristone to about 68%, so about two thirds. But it does save yeah. babies. Yeah. And um, I've met babies. It, I've but held but the abortion yeah. industry yeah. doesn't saved. want you to know that, it's, that, it's, that regret ever occurs. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I, I prescribe it. I, yeah. I have seen babies saved too. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an option for women who yeah. find it in yeah. your situation and say, can I, can I change what I've done? Yeah. So Yeah, I, I, I always find it funny because yeah. the burden of proof is always so heavily on us, but never on them. And so when they make a claim <laughs> like the abortion pill reversal is dangerous, mm -hmm. Since it's so false and so out of left field, mm -hmm. I almost don't know what to say other than you're lying. Yeah. And if you wanna, if you wanna make yeah. that claim, give me some proof. Uh -huh. We are gonna need something to argue on, and so we can go back and forth. We can have a discussion. But I've never heard somebody say chemical yeah. or the abortion pill reversal is dangerous, and then here's why. Right? It's just a blanket statement coming out of, you know, doctors who are pro-choice who think, yeah, people will listen yeah. to me. But it's even I've worse. I have letters in front of my name, and, and they'll listen to me if I tell them that yeah. it's dangerous, and I can continue the narrative that mm -hmm. abortion is fine and normal yeah. and no one ever. Why would you ever want to reverse right. abortion? The, the mainstream medical organizations tell us it's unethical. Yeah. Not just dangerous, but unethical <laughs> to try to save a child's life. This is how, how far we've come. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. It's, it's well, Chrissy, I know that you have spent many years researching this topic. A and while. so <laughs> I would love to hear from you, you know, you know, we're talking about people who are victims of the abortion industry and people who are professionals in this. And I want to know who's responsible for this rise in chemical abortion and how have we gone so far and why, you know, we're almost going in the opposite of direction of there are more regulations getting pulled out almost by the day it feels like. And yeah. so I would love for you to speak on of, of why is our culture heading this way? And, and who is responsible? You know, the abortion industry, what part do they play in this topic? Well, the chemical abortion pill is like a cell that's metastasized now throughout mm. our culture. It was brought into the U.S. market really through the efforts of, and, and, the, and not trying to be partisan, but the Democratic Party really mm -hmm. partnered with the uh, abortion corporations mm -hmm. to bring this pill into the market. Mm -hmm. uh, it started back in the 80s. Um, and what's what I think really interesting about the genesis of RU486 is it came from a company, Roussel Euclid, developed by a, a man who wanted to create an abortion pill. Mm -hmm. People try to tell us that abortion pills are um, medicinal, but they're not. This guy was literally designing uh, death by pill. He got funding from the company that created the drugs that killed the Jews in the uh, concentration camps. That's the kind of company legacy that we have. And the motivation behind it. Exactly. They knew it was mm -hmm. to kill. Well, he designed it to kill, but he did lie when he wanted to get funding because he said it was going to do some other things. Mm -hmm. So once again, lies are tied to the foundation of abortion. Mm -hmm. and, and then an industry designed for death is there too. Mm -hmm. 
So they developed these pills in the 80s and they want to bring them into the U.S. market. And Russo Euclid, which has other drugs, didn't want to um, have people picketing their drugs. You know, if you have a cold medicine and it makes you a lot of money, you don't want people to picket your cold medicine and, and you know, not buy that. So they didn't want to bring the U.S. the drugs into the U.S. themselves because they were afraid it would hurt their more profitable businesses. Right. So they made cut some deals with Bill Clinton at the center of it mm -hmm. to bring the chemical abortion pills into the U.S. through the Population Council, which is just a, an abortion advocacy group. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Bill Clinton ran on this. Um, like I said, I actually it's called the Population. Council. Isn't that yeah, funny? So the Anti-Population <laughs> Council. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, so I was working at Family Research Council at the time and National Right to Life was very mm -hmm. involved and we worked very hard to stop these pills and we stopped it all the way into Bill Clinton's second term when um, he they had a secret conclave. Harvard has a brilliant paper about this, except that I was there, so I don't really need the paper, but they have a great paper <laughs> if you wanted to fact check me, where they set this up and brought all these people in to broker this deal so that Russo Euclid would give the drug rights to the Population Council, who set up Danco, this fake company, basically, to make chemical abortion pills. Wow. And to this day, we don't know where these pills are made. Mm -hmm. We don't know when's the last time anybody from the FDA inspected these factories. And why that's relevant is, if you remember during the big COVID thing, mm -hmm. when we stopped production of baby food, because an uh, inspection of a factory mm -hmm. showed that the food wasn't being made properly. Mm -hmm. And we have filed uh, Freedom of Information Act's FOIA requests so have the pro -like doctors group. Applot's mm -hmm. been amazing. Where are the pills manufactured? When's the last time you guys checked mm -hmm. the clean water there? You know, what's the process mm -hmm. with that? Uh, so it was dirty and dark and clandestine, and they brought it in. And probably at that time, they didn't realize how big it might become. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people understand how big it will become. Right. Mm -hmm. The FDA allows you to sell these pills to 10 weeks. Planned Parenthood on their website says right up front that, they're, mm -hmm. that they don't care. They sell them to 11. Mm -hmm. It's on their website. Mm -hmm. The World Health Organization says you can sell them to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. All over the country, there are um, studies going on with a group called Genuity, which is just another way of saying we want to make money from chemical abortion. They want to take it into the 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. So by... The twelfth week from of pregnancy, the pill. just from the pill, twenty weeks. Yes. That's right. They want to take it all that the way. Seem sane. And, no. and records linkage studies internationally, forty percent failure requiring surgery. Exactly. They're going to kill the baby, and then if the woman is in distress, right. they don't care. It's they don't it's crazy. Care. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., ninety three point one percent of abortions, Lord. according to the CDC, take place by twelve weeks. Mm -hmm. So. Imagine that you have a reasonable pool of 93.7, uh, 0 0.1, sorry, in the U.S. We already have 54, says uh, Guttmacher, if you can believe them, and I don't, but, you know, they're <laughs> making it up. Uh, so, but in Finland and other countries where they actually track data, I believe the abortion rate for chemical abortion pills in Finland is like 97%. Wow. Mm -hmm. So they really intend to kill um, pre-born children. But in the U.S., what I find fascinating is they also clearly intend to kill women. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. If you wanted women to survive these pills, you would do an ultrasound to see, yeah. does she have an ectopic pregnancy and how long the pregnancy is? Mm -hmm. yep. I'm RH negative. So when an RH negative woman, blood type, that's 15% of the population. Right. Uh, when you have an exchange of blood in pregnancy by birth, by miscarriage, or by abortion, you can get these antibodies that form that will attack future pregnancies, you're basically sterilized. So you get this Rogam shot. I will say it's the most painful shot I've ever had. <laughs> I've had it multiple times. <laughs> and it, uh, but it, it goes in, it kills the bad antibodies. I was even in a fender bender at seven months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And they gave me Rogam in case mm -hmm. I had bleeding of my placenta. Mm -hmm. But I also have four beautiful children. Mm -hmm. So the abortion industry doesn't want to um, protect women's lives with an ultrasound or their fertility with a Rogam shot. And in the Journal of Contraception, Dr. Daniel Grossman, who I really consider to be one of the more evil people in the planet right now, <laughs> he his whole business is trying to figure out how to kill more people yeah. and make money, you know, and that's yeah. there's that. So in the journal Contraception, which is as creepy as it sounds, but it's the scientific journal of the abortion industry, yeah. they did a study on whether or not you should have to give Rogam to protect fertility um, in the U.S. And they said three things. They said, number one, well, even though 
the American Abortion Federation, the abortion lobby, said that they should give Rogam for decades, mm -hmm. even though that was our standard of care. Um, number one, uh, there's not a test that specifically says that you are really becoming sterile early in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So what? We have plenty of tests that show you can become sterile, number one. Number two, there's no law that's gonna make us give you this drug to protect your fertility. So I thought doctors were supposed to do no harm, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> number three, they said, and I'm, this is hilariously horrible, maybe women wanted to be sterilized. Mm. And I'm like, did maybe you? they want women to be sterilized. Yes. No, they said maybe the women did. And I'm like, <laughs> well, you would have to tell a woman, you know, if you don't get blood typed and right. gets this shot in 24 to 48 hours, you could never have another yeah. child. Mm -hmm. Did you tell them that, mm -hmm. you know, or is it just go fish? And it's it's go fish. It's they and they said in in reporting on this study that it was um, a barrier to entry to require um, people who want to sell these pills to protect the health of the women taking them. Mm -hmm. I, I want to use very foul language here, but I won't because I know it's <laughs> probably a family show. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying in America is it's really okay to be maimed and killed in the con in the pursuit of abortion. But can any other drug be sold in ways known to harm people? And we don't take any precautions, you know, of any kind whatsoever. And even known risks like infertility mm -hmm. and death for lack of ultrasound screening, whatever. Because as long as the baby died, it's okay mm -hmm. if the mother's dead too. Yeah. And if she can't ever have another child, well, I guess it's all well, good, Well, they right? gave me the pills in 1999 and they weren't even FDA approved yet. Mm. Oh my gosh. So. Exactly. It's experimental at that point. Yeah. And not just yeah. infertility, but um, damage to subsequent children. If isoimmunization occurs in that scenario, the mother's antibodies create severe anemia in that child. And untreated studies around the world tell us 14% of those children are stillborn oh if they're not gosh. treated. Half suffer neonatal death or brain damage. So it's not just preventing subsequent pregnancies, it's actively destroying subsequent children. And another issue, um, if a woman fails her chemical abortion and needs surgery, a study showed us that she has 361% increased risk of a preterm delivery in a subsequent pregnancy because of the damage to the cervix. Um, and we also know that these surgeries, when they're done in emergent situations, can damage the interior of the uterus so that the placenta ab attaches abnormally. So not just infertility, but subsequent babies who may be, be born early or die because of this. Right. And um, the ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, that, that promotes, un unfortunately. You mean the abortion lobby? Just so. well, <laughs> it, it's my professional organization, <laughs> and I, 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 I don't know what they're thinking. But in their um, recent um, discussion about Rogam, they said, we still recommend it, but if it would basically slow down access to an abortion, shared decision making says that we can forego it. Oh but gosh. we know the doctor didn't even, wouldn't even You're show right. you your baby. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna talk to you about right. Rogam and future pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So what's the shared decision making? And, and of course, when these women are getting them through the mail without any doctor, mm -hmm. who's, who's, yeah. who's making the decision there? It, what's so funny yeah. about it is, and I had about three of those shots in each pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked me if I wanted to have this shot. Mm -hmm. My doctor's like, you're, on, you're H negative. You're getting you get a shot. Yeah. <laughs> Standard so of care. You Don't brought up the abortion yeah. lobby. Yeah. Um, and there's obviously laws. How are the laws in our country, or lack of laws, making the chemical abortion situation worse? Well, under the um, evil umbrella of Roe v. Wade, where early abortion was an absolute right, it obviously wasn't, <laughs> but you could not prevent a pre-viability of abortion under Roe. So in a way, at that point, these pills had carte blanche, but they also, uh, there were surgical abortion centers and chemical abortion pill centers, and it wasn't as big, um, I, I'm not saying it wasn't a big business model, but it was like this, again, I, to me, I considered a cancer that was lying in wait and growing underneath the rubric. And during the COVID administration, COVID administration, felt like it, didn't it? <laughs> during the uh, COVID crisis, Planned Parenthood quietly set up telehealth in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's like, and it, think of it as a liquor license. You can't just ship liquor to a state. You have right. to go in state by state. Yeah. They finished that process during COVID so that they could really um, pump this up. So um, 
I, what I think is extraordinary in regards to where we are today, where we can stop it, is there was a court case that was started in uh, Hawaii. Um, I don't know if I'm saying the doctor's name right, but he's an abortionist, so he probably doesn't deserve the courtesy. But let's say Dr. Chilius. <laughs> you know, that's what it looks like on paper. <laughs> and he said it was just so inconvenient for him to hop around to these islands to give these pills when, you know, sure, it would save women's lives, but my gosh, I'd have to get on a plane. So she should probably die if you have to get on a plane, I guess. So he started a lawsuit <laughs> saying they should be able to ship these pills. Mm -hmm. wow. And it was through that lawsuit that now Javier Becerra, who is head of HHS, mm -hmm. uh, while he was Attorney General of, Can of um, California, was pushing reduced health and safety standards to make it easier to sell these pills. And this was progressing over a five to seven year period. And then during COVID, I think surprisingly, coincidentally, a month or two after Planned Parenthood finished their telehealth certification, they dropped the REMS, and you could sell them in the name of COVID mm -hmm. uh, online, no test online distribution. And as a, mm -hmm. and what's funny to me is England, in the same time frame during COVID, uh, decided they also needed to drop their REMS and sell the pills. They've mm -hmm. since put theirs back on wow. because mm -hmm. people were dying and yeah. abusers were getting it. But what they mm -hmm. found in particular, and Dr. Scott, you might want to say this, a lot of women don't know how pregnant they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So whether through yeah. ignorance yeah. or lack of inquiry, mm -hmm. people were taking them so late in pregnancy, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. killing yeah. them. Yeah. And so yeah. England put their health and safety standards back. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is saying that states can't put, cannot um, enforce postal laws if you want to mail abortion pills. Yeah. Wow. Well, so and sort of like this is slightly, you know, different, but oh, I'm always shocked by the lack of knowledge young women have about their own fertility. I mean, when I yeah. tell girls that they're fertile six days a month, they look at me like I'm lying to them. Like, you mean like I can't just pregnant become pregnant at any point in my cycle? <laughs> and, and girls' cycles are so irregular and this and that. And I've even talked to people who don't understand that, you know, the way that we track pregnancy, four weeks pregnant isn't, you know, it's not what you really think of it. You know, it's, right. you know, that's based on your last period. When you're four weeks pregnant, the baby is gestationally, you know, more like two weeks. And so just the lack of information of that, how are young women supposed to then be able to navigate? How do I get a chemical abortion? When do I take mm -hmm. it? You know, right. all of these things when they're so misinformed about, you mean, you know, you know, to be able to track exactly where you are in your pregnancy it takes a lot of time a lot of tracking a lot of knowing how your body works and if a 17 year old girl wants to order an abortion and guess that she's eight with weeks pregnant she can mm -hmm. yeah. it's crazy I'm, I'm sure you see it often i've yeah. known many women who've been pregnant and you know they go in and they say well yeah. i think i'm about eight weeks pregnant and then they yeah. get the ultrasound and the uh -huh. doctor says no you're about 16 weeks pregnant yeah. Yeah. and no. they, did, they had no idea <laughs> right. yeah it's easy to be further along you have a little spotting early in pregnancy you think it's a period no you already that was implantation right. so you're a month you know, further along. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it happens yeah. commonly. I was terrible at guessing. Uh -huh. I was wrong every time. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was paying attention. <laughs> that is one thing about the probably movement. I've learned so much about my own fertility <laughs> and how my body works. And it's so important. Um, but anyways, the last thing I wanted to really touch on is, you know, we're saying that this is the future of abortion. And I think something that happened recently is a clear indicator of that that Walgreens, Rite Aid, and CVS are now going to be distributing the abortion pill. When my mom heard this, being my mom, she marched <laughs> into our Walgreens. We live in Washington State, so of course they're going to be carrying it. And she talked to the manager or somebody about, ah, this can't happen. And he was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, there's no, dude, this isn't happening. He was literally Man, fighting with her that this wasn't true. And I was just thinking... If the employees of Walgreens are mm -hmm. this blind to the fact that this is happening, mm -hmm. like right. America is even mm -hmm. worse off. Yeah. Like if, right. if the company itself is not even know. informing their own employees that this is mm -hmm. coming down the pipeline, like mm -hmm. people all across the country, it's, you know, they're doing this in times where people aren't paying attention. You know, it, I mean, I think the FDA, they, they changed the rule that allowed pharmacies 
to distribute chemical abortion pills, what, January 2nd? I'm thinking yeah. I was probably taking down my Christmas tree. You yeah. know, I was cleaning up after my yeah. New Year party. I wasn't paying attention. I feel like I jumped back on social right. media and I was like, what happened? <laughs> They're doing it right. silently. Yeah. And, and, and pushing us further and further and further. Well, and further here's further. another thing that I don't think people understand is they're trying to set up a new Supreme Court and a new Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. About a week or two before the Dobbs decision got rid of Roe v. Wade, there was a case uh, regarding the Environmental Protection Agency where they had radically overstepped in their policy. And the Supreme Court said these regulatory agencies, which are cannot run around and make rules with the force of law, you know, they have to be specifically given permission by the lawmaking body, Congress, mm -hmm. uh, to to do that. So fast forward to like the week before Christmas, and I'm not kidding, and I do have four kids. I had stuff to do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they had this during the budget palooza where they're trying to jam that money in right before mm -hmm. the budget deadline. Um, so members in the House, the Democratic Party, Nancy Pelosi and company put forward a measure to say that the FDA should have the authority to make the force of law in regards to chemical abortion pills. Mm -hmm. They want the FDA to be the new Supreme Court and those regulations to be the new Roe v. Wade. That's what they're trying to do. So it's not it's a clear and present danger in terms of trying to set up a new rubric. And then what HHS said directly through their lawyers uh, uh, and the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. They said they did not feel states had the right to make laws different than the FDA. Well, that's insane because like even if you look at euthanasia laws, euthanasia varies by state uh, and you can't go kill people in one state because you can do it in Washington state. Right. The FDA having said that some drugs can be used for a certain purpose doesn't require a state to use it, mm -hmm. but that's not how that Democrats interpreted it. They, they said, yes, you should be able to require this in the name of the FDA. I think it's terrifying, really, that we're going to set up again. I guess we're all marching out to the FDA building now to <laughs> face the future Dr. Fauci type person who's going to be there on behalf of abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tony, you were one of the only people, as far as I'm aware, at this table who has actually experienced a chemical abortion. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that it's absolutely horrific and you wouldn't wish it on your enemies. Right. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a woman who's considering or maybe has gone through the same shoes? What would your advice for her be um, to know that she does have other options yeah. or, you know, even that there is healing for her mm -hmm. um, and that her story matters? Yeah, for the woman who would be considering it, I would say that women are stronger than we think. And I know it might be scary in the moment, mm -hmm. but you have other options. If I could go back knowing what I know now, I would give my baby life. Whether I would give him up for adoption or chosen to parent, but I would want her to know the truth, all the truth that I did not receive that this will harm you, this will never leave you, <laughs> that um, the regret will stay with you. Although you can heal, you know, um, spiritually, mentally, you can heal, but it's not gonna leave you. Mm -hmm. And I think every woman should even have to see <laughs> what an abortion, what each yeah, of so them. Many people don't know what Yeah, they don't even know. I mean, it's, that's why the, the surgical ones, that's why they're asleep. You know, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't know what's actually happening. So, mm -hmm. um, but the woman who's already gone through it, I would just tell her that um, there are other women like her that are suffering in silence yeah. and that find someone that you trust to be able to walk through that and get counseling, get post-abortion counseling. There's so many resources out there that could help you walk through all of that because keeping it inside is manifesting in ways that you don't understand. And um, yeah, and so I'm just very thankful that I'm on the other side now and can bring hope and healing to, to others who have walked through it. But I wouldn't, I would say choose life every time, choose life, mm -hmm. not death. Amen. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure to hear all of the, your knowledge and your knowledge and your story. Um, we are so grateful at Students for Life and we would love to have you on again soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. much.